Well, hello, everyone. Welcome. We're so glad you've chosen to join us for this online worship service. Wherever you are, wherever you are uh, watching, whatever device you're using, however you're streaming it, or wherever you are in the country or around the world, we know we have people who join us for online worship services all around the nation and even outside of our country, and we're glad that you're with us wherever you are. In fact, at Chapel Street Church, we want to be a place for where you are. For those of us that are here in the United States of America, today's July 4th, it's Independence Day. It's a day that we celebrate our independence as a nation. As followers of Jesus, we thank God for the freedom we have in this country and our dependence on Him. So I thought the best way for us to begin before we jump into the sermon is to take a moment and let's, let's go before the Lord in prayer on this Independence Day. Will you pray with me? Father God, creator of heaven and earth, you have made all peoples of the earth for your pleasure and you've appointed all nations of the earth for your glory. As a people who have pledged allegiance to you, Jesus, we pray today for the nation in which we dwell. We thank you for the blessings of liberty in America, for this generation and for those to come. We give thanks to you for all who have bravely given their lives in defense of our freedom. And we thank you for your gracious hand, which has given us so much in our country. And at the same time, Lord, we recognize that we have fallen short as individuals and as a nation. We have failed to live up to the ideals of our own nation and more importantly, to the holy standards of your word. O oh Lord, our nation is in need of you. Our government and leaders and officials are in need of you. Our cities and towns are in need of you. Our schools and universities are in need of you. Our industries and businesses are in need of you. May we look only to you on this Independence Day and recognize that we are wholly dependent on you and you alone. We pray that you would help us as a nation to strive for your vision of righteousness and justice that your care for the widow, the orphan, the poor, the alien would flow like a mighty stream through our nation. May we be people of humility, generosity, and compassion. May the weakest among us, the unborn, the poor, the oppressed, the elderly, be shown your justice and mercy. We pray that we who are the followers of the Prince of Peace and his kingdom would be a people of peace seeking to live in peace with one another. We pray that hate and division would give way to love and unity. We pray that the church of Christ in our land would be found faithful. We pray, O oh Lord, that we would be a faithful witness to the kingdom of God, wherever you've placed us. That your church in this nation would be a city set on a hill. That the church in this nation would be faithfully modeling the way of salvation, the way of following Jesus. We ask all this in the name of your Son, our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, if you're tuning in for the first time, you haven't been tracking, we are in a series on the book of Revelation called Seven, the Seven Churches of Revelation. Uh, Revelation begins in the first three chapters ad addressing these seven churches in Asia Minor, but really the church universal at that time in the first century and in the 21st century today. It's a letter written to churches all over. We've been talking about this book and why some Christians avoid it or get confused by it or obsess over it for the wrong reasons. But I want to begin by asking this question. Have you ever seen something that you can't unsee? It's, it's changed you by seeing it? You saw something that you can't stop thinking about and you're different because of, of what you witnessed. Or perhaps you saw something happen. I think the birth of a child is like this. I can, I'm not the same having watched my three children come into this world. Maybe you're a mom or a dad, you, you know what that's like. Or, or sometimes a natural, scene of natural beauty can be this way. Something in creation can take our breath away and burn itself into our brain and mind and we, we remember it, we see it in it with our mind's eye. Or perhaps you've seen someone in a new light. You thought you knew them and somehow you saw them or experienced them in a way you never had before and it changed forever the way you looked at them. Well, when we come to this section of Revelation chapter 1, John, the author of Revelation, to whom Jesus revealed himself. By the way, it's Revelation, not Revelations. There's only one Revelation, the Revelation of Jesus Christ, from Jesus Christ to John, who wrote it down so that we could see it by reading it. Anyway, John's giving us his picture of those two things. He has an encounter, a vision, a revelation of Jesus that changes him forever. He can never look at Jesus the same way again. Now, this might be a lot to ask for one sermon, but maybe our prayer ought to be, God, help us to see you in a way that we, we can never think of you in the same way again by reading this book, by meditating on it, and by, by going through what he says to us. You know, I think that's what we need today as individuals and in the church today. More than ever, we need a vision of Jesus that changes us. We need a, a grander, bigger picture of who he is. For too many Christians, in my opinion, in the world today, specifically in American suburbs where we are, 
I think Jesus is some far away, distant figure of the first century that's lost to our imagination, or maybe even we think of him as half fiction. Or for many, it's, Jesus is, is my, my homeboy. He's my close buddy. He's my cozy best friend, my BFF. Now, John, of course, would say, John's the beloved disciple, he would say, Jesus wants to have an intimate relationship with you. But maybe he would caution us from having too cozy a picture of Jesus as our BFF. Maybe he might say, you need a bigger vision of who Jesus really is. Uh, this quote has been attributed to different authors, and I'm not exactly sure who said it. It's been uh, attributed to Voltaire, the f French philosopher, but whatever. He, he may have said these words, which are true nonetheless, whoever said them. God, in the beginning, created man and woman in his own image, and we have been trying to return the favor ever since, meaning trying to create God in our image, trying to shape him to fit our idea of what he ought to be like. One of the pictures that I grew up with in the church that I went to when I was a kid, and perhaps you did as well, is this image right here. It's Warner Solomon's The Head of Christ. It's very famous. It's on uh, church <laughs> fellowship halls, and uh, it, it's been reproduced by the end of the 20th century over half a billion times. It may be one of the most iconic and common images of Jesus in the world. But honestly, look at this for just a minute. Doesn't he look a little white to you? Jesus with blue eyes, a perfectly manicured beard. Look at his feet. He looks more like one of the Bee Gees, to be honest, to me, like, like Andy Gibb or Barry Gibb's brother that you didn't know about than, than, than maybe Jesus of the first century. Jesus was a Middle Eastern man, a Middle Eastern Jew. Anyway, clearly, War, Warner Solomon made him in his own image or the image of, of the culture in which he grew up. We all do that in different ways. I remember hearing um, Timothy Keller quote uh, an African-American pastor, Tom Skinner, who uh, was a gang member in Harlem and became a pastor and ministered in the inner city Harlem context. And he said about this very image of Warner Solomon, as head of Christ, he said, when I first saw that painting of Jesus, I thought, I don't know who that's supposed to be, but I know he wouldn't last five minutes in my neighborhood. <laughs> because in his mind, that can't be what, who Jesus is. We all have a mental picture of Jesus that at best is incomplete. At worst, it's false. And God in his mercy and grace wants to give us a bigger vision of who he is. Uh, A.W. Tozer says, we tend by a secret law of the soul to move toward our mental image of God. I think he's right. We are moving toward, becoming like, drifting toward the way that we think about God, our mental picture of him. Now, if this is true, and if it's also true that we tend to make God in our own image, then we really need to see Jesus differently. We really need this. So let's read through the text together, Revelation 1, verses 9 through 20, and see what Jesus has to show us through the words of John. I, John, your brother and partner in the tribulation and the kingdom and the patient endurance that are in Jesus, was on the island called Patmos on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet saying, write what you see in a book and send it to the seven churches to Ephesus, and to Smyrna, and to Pergamum, and Thyatira, and Sardis, and to Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me, and on turning I saw seven golden lampstands, and in the midst of the lampstands one like the Son of Man, clothed with a long robe and a golden sash around his chest. The hairs of his head were white, like the white wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze, refined in a furnace, and his voice was like the roar of many waters. In his right hand he held seven stars. From his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun shining in full strength. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying, Fear not, I am the first and the last, the living one. I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and Hades. As for the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. Wow. Now John is the first one to have this vision, and he's told to write it down. He's specifically instructed to record it so that we too could have the same experience, the same revelation through John's record. Remember, revelation is less a code that we crack about the future, and more like lenses through which we see something we could not see otherwise, by which we see. So let's try and put on those lenses.
In, in verse 16, uh, John says that Jesus' face was like the sun shining in full strength. Well, that's interesting, isn't it? Have you, have you ever looked at the sun shining in full strength? No, you, you, I mean, if you, if you did for any length of time, you'd be blind. You can't. When I was a kid, you know, your parents say, don't look at the sun. It's bad for your eyes. You, you almost can't not do it, right? But it blinds you. You see spots, you know, you, you can only get a glimpse of it. So what does he mean? Well, he's clearly not giving us like a description for a police sketch artist. What was he like? Well, he was like the sun shining full strength. How are you going to draw that, right? That's impossible. He's describing power and radiance and glory, but he, it's almost indescribable. In, in August of 2017, you might remember this, here in Illinois, the, there was a solar eclipse that we, was visible from Illinois, southern Illinois most specifically, but we could see it here in northern Illinois. And I recall going to the gas station and buying those goggles. They were available everywhere. You could get the solar eclipse goggles, the little paper things overcharged to put on so you could see it. Well, it was a cloudy day where I was, and I didn't need the goggles at all. But you know, everyone was buying these goggles to watch the, the solar eclipse. In other words, to enable us to see. And that's essentially what John is doing for us here. In the Old Testament, people could not look at God face to face directly because it would destroy them. It would undo them. You might remember in Exodus 33, Moses has this encounter where he begs God to see his face. Let me see your glory, Lord. And God says, well, if you, if you did, it would destroy you. But I will hide you in the cleft of a rock and I'll pass by. And just before I'm out of sight, I'll let you catch a glimpse of my back, which is all you can really handle. And it changed Moses forever. But we in the New Testament are told that in Jesus, we are seeing the full glory, the radiance, the exact imprint of the nature of the Father. In fact, Jesus says himself in John 14 to his disciples, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So no more hiding in, in small glimpses, but the full picture of who he is. The Apostle Paul puts it this way in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Paul says, we, all of us who believe in Jesus, with unveiled faces, that's a reference to Moses who had to veil his face because it was too terrifying for the people to look at when he, when he beheld just a glimpse of God's glory in the Old Testament. We have unveiled faces, can see God's glory fully in Jesus, we're being transformed into the same image. What image is that? The image of Jesus. Paul says in, in Galatians 4, I pray that you may be conformed to the image of Christ. We're being transformed into his image. How? By beholding him. Did you catch that? Paul is saying, beholding is the way of becoming. The way that you become like Jesus is by beholding Jesus, seeing him. If you and I ever hope to grow or to change or to be transformed as followers of Jesus, it is only through beholding the glory of the Son that's going to happen. This means that your greatest need, friends, is not financial. It's not occupational. It's not relational. It's not, uh, you know, marital or family. Uh, it, it's not physical or medical even. Those may be needs that you have, but our greatest need is to see Jesus. To, to have a greater vision and grasp of who he really is. And this is why, as, as a pastor and preacher, and those of us who preach here, our primary job is to hold up Jesus to you, to give you a greater picture of who he is, his beauty and majesty and glory. Because that's the way you're going to become like him. I, I know very often I get emails and conversations with people who say, why don't you talk about this or preach about this or this issue? And there are issues to address. I'm not denying that. But they're never ending. And those even aren't our greatest need. Our greatest need is to see Jesus, who he really is. And you might be thinking, well, okay, fine, but I I've never seen him. He's ascended to heaven. I've never seen Jesus. How can I be transformed by his glory? How can I behold him if I can't see him physically? Well, in, in, in 2 Corinthians 4, one chapter later, the Apostle Paul says that we actually see the, the light of the glory of Christ through the gospel. So it's in the gospel that we see the glory of Jesus. That's what it's given to us for. In fact, in Revelation 1, verse 3, we're told this very thing. Blessed are those who read and who hear and who keep. So what John saw, we hear and we read. That's what it's there for. So maybe if you look at your life and you think, well, I, 
I'm not experiencing transformation. I'm not, I don't feel like I am being transformed from one glory into another. I'm sort of stuck in this temptation, in this issue in my life, in this area. I don't feel like I'm being changed. I can relate to that, believe it or not. But maybe we ought to pause and ask ourselves, if that's the case, what am I beholding? What am I staring at? I don't mean physically right now. I mean with your life. What's the, where have you aimed your heart? And what are you beholding with your life? What, how much time do you spend thinking about, meditating on, praying about, and reading about who God is? As against Twitter, Facebook, sports talk radio, ESPN, or whatever, Instagram, whatever else you're into. Maybe the reason we're not being transformed is we're not beholding him. Who or what are we beholding? Okay, let's, let's dig in then to what John says specifically in this text. First, I want to I look at three ways Jesus revealed to us. First, the Jesus who speaks to us. The Jesus who speaks to us. Jesus, do you know he's, he has spoken and he is speaking? You believe that? He's, he's a risen Savior. He's a living Lord. He has spoken and he's speaking even now. Hebrews chapter 1, verse two, 1 and 2 tells us this, that in the long ago, God spoke to the prophets, but in these last days, he's spoken to us through his Son, who is the radiance of God, the, Im- the exact imprint of his nature. So Jesus is speaking to us through his word. Let's look again at Revelation 1, verses 9 through 11 and make a few notations here. I, John, your brother and partner in the tribulation. Isn't that interesting? He says, I'm your brother and partner in the tribulation and in the kingdom. He said, I'm with you in this. I'm suffering with you. And the patient endurance that are in Jesus was on the island called Patmos. That's interesting. John tells us where he is. He's on an island called Patmos on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. Now, let's go, let me think about, talk about this for a minute. John is saying that because of Jesus, and specifically proclaiming Jesus, he's in exile on the island of Patmos. You see an image here of that island. It doesn't look like it'd be too bad a place to to be, uh, an island uh, of the Greek peninsula in the Mediterranean Sea. It's about 10 miles long and 6 miles wide. Uh, They spruced it up today in the 21st century, but in the first century it was desolate. There was nothing there. John's on the island on his own, because he's been proclaiming the name of Jesus. And in verse 10, he says, I was in the Spirit. Now, what does that mean? Well, honestly, I'm not 100% sure what it means in the Spirit, but I'll tell you what it doesn't mean. There are those who will tell you that that, that's that's sort of a divine trance you can conjure up or put yourself in. Let's go back to that text for just a minute. He says that I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. He's saying that he was so focused on who God is and what he was saying to him, that he was just tuned in to the Spirit of God. And that's not something you manufacture, conjure up, or make by some specific trance you put yourself in or by following these steps. It's something God does for us. And then he says that he was doing, that this was the case on the Lord's day. I was thinking about this. He's in exile, in prison really, on an island, desolate, deserted island, by himself. And it's Sunday. And he goes to church by himself on the Lord's Day. He's worshiping, meditating, praising, and praying to God on the Lord's Day. I ask myself, would I do that if I was exiled, isolated, cut off by myself? Would I still worship God? Would I still set aside a day or or more to meditate on him? For our 25th anniversary, my wife and I went to an island, an island called Kauai, one of the Hawaiian islands. Never been there before. It was amazing. We had a fantastic time. And on a Sunday... Let's go to church. Let's go to some island church. We found a little church on the island of Kauai. Went there. Everybody's wearing Hawaiian shirts and sandals. I thought, this is pretty cool. I like this. They sang some island worship songs, some familiar worship songs. The pastor preached a a sermon about passing the baton spiritually. I still remember it. He held the baton. I know many people go on vacation, island or not, and it's a vacation from church. Just interesting to me that John is exiled and imprisoned for preaching the name of Jesus, but he doesn't stop worshiping. He doesn't stop seeking him. And God gives him this revelation. In verse 11, he's told specifically, the first thing Jesus says to him is, write down what you see and put it in a book. Write it down and put it in a book. Can we just pause for a minute and praise God and thank him that he told John to do that, that he did, that we have it? Write it down, put it in a book so that we will have this. 
And we do. We'll talk about why. He says, Jesus says, get your pen ready, John. I'm going to show you something, and you're going to want to get this down. You're gonna, it's going to be good. You're going to want to record this. Now, I was thinking about this question. Would you rather have the written account or the revelation itself? I think my first reaction to that is that I would rather have the revelation itself. I'd rather have the thing. But if you pause and think about that for a minute, it, it, it's pretty overwhelming what happens to John. And we have the account that we can go back to over and over and over again for a reason. It's no accident. It's no lesser revelation for us that God gave it to us in the written word. We, we think of it that way because we don't really understand the power of his word, what it means to see Jesus in the gospel. But it's not lesser than. Okay, now, the next five verses describe in vivid, symbolic imagery what John saw. But again, this is not a description of what he, uh, we're meant to pull apart and analyze every aspect. We'll talk about some of the symbols. But what it's primarily given to us for is to see the full picture of who Jesus is. And then in seeing, we would be filled with wonder and amazement and awe. We'd be astounded. This is the Jesus who astounds us. Jesus speaks to us, and he shows us who he is, and he astounds us by that. Have you ever been astounded by Jesus? I mean, really, have you ever, have you ever been so just overwhelmed with this thought of who he really is? When's the last time you were astounded by Jesus? Thought about him, maybe a worship song, driving to your car, mountaintop experience, quietness of your own kitchen table with a cup of coffee early in the morning, and something came over you, or you just got a glimpse of his glory, and it astounded you. I think we need that. So, in a sense, Jesus says to John, prepare to be astounded. Let me read to you this quote from N.T. Wright. He says, imagine what it would look like if the curtain between heaven and earth were suddenly pulled back, revealing Jesus, who had been there all along, but whom we had managed to either ignore or to cut him down to our own size. This is the answer. A Jesus who is mind-blowing, dramatically powerful, astounding in glory, but who is also gentle and gracious, a Jesus who has spoken and still speaks to his people. So in verse 12, John turns around to see who it is that's speaking to him, and whoa, let's look at what he sees. Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me, and on turning I saw seven golden lampstands, in the midst of the lampstands one like the Son of Man, clothed the long robe and a golden sash around his chest. The hairs of his head were white, like white wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire, his feet like burnished bronze, refined in a furnace. And his voice was like the roar of many waters. In his right hand he held seven stars, from his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun shining in full strength. What a description. Now, verse 20, which we didn't read a moment ago, we did earlier, interprets verse 12. In verse 20, John, Jesus tells John what the lampstand and the stars actually are. So verse 20 interprets verse 12 for us. The stars are the angels and the lampstands are the churches themselves. Now, notice in verse 13, Jesus is standing where? He's standing in the midst of the lampstands. If the lampstands are the churches, Jesus is not standing above them or far off from them or off to the side or somewhere else, but right in the midst of the churches. The, the, the seven lampstands are, seven's a number of perfection in the Bible. It's referring to the, God's perfect church at all times and all places throughout history. He's in the midst of her. Chapel Street Church, we're a lampstand. We're supposed to be a light to the world. And Jesus is in our midst in our presence. Without him, there is no church. There's no light. There's no lampstand. I just love that image. that He's standing in the midst of his church. And then we're told, like a son of man. Now you hear that phrase, you might think, well, what does that mean? It's tempting to think, well, that means the, that it's a reference to his humanity. He says, one like a son of man. But it's not. It's actually a reference to his divinity. It comes from Daniel chapter 7. Uh, it's one of Jesus' favorite references to himself in the Gospels. The Son of Man, Daniel 7. Daniel has a vision of the Ancient of Days, and one as the Son of Man comes to him and was bestowed on the Son of Man all power and authority over all nations and kingdoms of the earth and over all the universe, really. So it's, it's a description of his divinity, not his humanity. And what follows is, the, is this image of Jesus that John gives us. 
And it's tempting to think, well, what does that all mean and how, what would that look like? It would be impossible to draw. I found this ridiculous image of somebody attempting to draw Revelation 1 Jesus, right? I mean, I got to tell you, his eyes aren't flaming fire, first of all. He looks a little creepy, maybe even like he's on something, you know, this doesn't look right to me. There's a sword kind of in his mouth, there's a lampstand. It just looks ridiculous trying to draw that. You couldn't, it's not in, given for that reason, to, but it's given to overwhelm us and to show us his character and his nature. The long robe, the golden sash, these are images of his priestly nature, that he's our perfect high priest, who is the sacrifice for us that takes away our sin. His white hair in verse uh, 14, white as wool is not meaning he has, Jesus has gray hair or white hair. It means it's a symbol of maturity and wisdom. He's ageless in his wisdom as the ancient of days. Eyes like flame of fire. I love this image. One commentator I read says it means he has a penetrating gaze. For those of us who know him and are loved by him, it's a gaze that we love and long for. But for those that don't know him, it's a very unsettling and terrifying gaze. But what it means is that he searches and sees through everything, including you. Jesus sees through. He sees you. Do you hear that? Jesus sees you. All of you. How does that make you feel? For some of you, maybe it makes you feel really nervous. But for others, maybe it comforts you to know that the king of the universe sees you and loves you. Eyes flaming, burning, penetrating right down to our soul. His feet like burnished bronze, that is referred to, reference to his moral purity. They're refined in a furnace. This is a reference to he's perfect, he's pure. He's standing on the foundation of his own moral perfection. Voice like the roar of many waters. What does that mean? You ever stood at the base of a massive waterfall, maybe Niagara Falls? I remember years ago on a trip to Ecuador, the San Rafael Falls, which are gone now, but was the largest waterfall over 500 feet in Ecuador in the jungles. Just it's down, standing down at the base, it was deafening to hear these three rivers merging and pouring over 500 feet this cliff. Couldn't even, this close to somebody shouting, you couldn't hear their voice because it was so deafening. In a way, John's saying his voice is overwhelming. It's all I could hear. Don't you wish that was true? All the noise in our culture, which competes for his voice, to be able to say, his voice drowns them all out. I only hear him. It's often not true for me. Mouth is a sharp two-edged sword uh, that cuts straight through, right to the heart. This is a reference to the Word of God in the New Testament. Timothy, Paul to Timothy calls the Word of God the, the two-edged, sharper than a two-edged sword. We're told it's a sword of judgment in Revelation 19, but it cuts both ways, in other words. It can be life-giving or destructing, destructive for those who don't know him. Right to our soul. Face, again, shine like the sun in full strength. I, I don't really have the words. John gave us the words to tell us what this really means. But I would just encourage you, you could, there's not better time for you to spend than to read verses 12 through 16 over and over again this week and ponder who this Jesus really is. Now, how do you respond to a Jesus like this? What do you do? How, how do you react to this vision? Well, let's look at how John reacts. Uh, in verses 17 through 18, here's how John reacts. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Isn't that crazy? As though dead. Like passed out, unconscious, as though I'm dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying, Fear not, I am the first and the last and the living one. I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore. And I have the keys of death and Hades. These two verses, 17 and 18, are the heart of the whole thing. The vision is crucial, but here's what it all means for us. Because you might be thinking, what does this mean for me? It's the key passage. Here's a question. Why would John be so afraid? Isn't John called the beloved disciple? Don't we read in John 13 and 14 at the Last Supper, he's reclining on Jesus' breast? Isn't he one of his clo the closest friend of Jesus? Didn't he spend three years eating, sleeping, walking, talking, living with Jesus in close, intimate relationship? I mean, why is he terrified? Why is he falling down like he's dead? It's one thing to see Jesus in his humanity. It's another thing to see him in the fullness of his glory, the king of the universe. And if John needs a bigger vision of Jesus, then who are we to think we haven't figured out? <laughs> we all need that. And I, one commentator, Michael Gorman, uh, wrote this, if we're not falling down dead to be resurrected, then we are not understanding Revelation and we're not seeing Jesus. 
Isaiah chapter 6, Isaiah has the vision of God in his temple, in his holiness, and he, he says, woe is me. He, like, he, he has the same reaction. Peter, with a miraculous catch, you'll remember, he recognizes, go away from me, Lord, I'm a sinful man, falls down on his knees. When you really come in close contact with the holiness of God, the perfection of God, the beauty and glory of God, it both attracts you and puts you on your face because you realize how far you are from him, how, how far sh short we fall from his perfect standard. I think God's glory and, ho and holiness is the thing that we most need and that we most run from in our lives because we're sinful. And that's why John's on his face. And verse 18 is so tender and so beautiful and so powerful, and you need to see this and hear this. But he laid his hand, right hand on me. Th this is, the right hand is the symbol of power and authority in scripture. In his right hand, he holds all the universe and all things together by the power of his right hand. It's his hand of power and authority that he places on John, not to crush him, not to destroy him, not to wipe him out, but to bless and restore him. This is the Jesus who restores us. The Jesus who restores us is the final way we see Jesus. This is the reason we don't have to be afraid, that Jesus who restores us. Jesus says to John, don't be afraid. John is afraid. And Jesus says, fear not. And then he says this, I hold in my hands the keys of death and Hades. I was dead and I'm alive forevermore. I'm the first and the last. He's conquered death, which the Bible calls the last and greatest enemy. He's defeated it. What are you afraid of? What are you afraid God can't do for you? What do you think he doesn't care enough or isn't capable enough of doing? Whatever it is, he's done it. He can do it. He's conquered death for you. He died and rose for you. He holds the keys of, of heaven and hell itself. There's nothing he can't unlock in your life. There's nothing he can't release you from or guide you through. What are you afraid of? What are you afraid he might ask of you? Whatever it is, he's gone there himself. He's done it himself. This means that he's alive right now, friends. Jesus is alive right now. This Jesus that John saw is alive right now, and he's at work right now in you, on your Patmos. We've all got a place of exile and isolation in our lives where we feel sidelined, where we feel that we're cut off or not worthy. He's at work there. This Jesus, the risen, reigning king of the universe, says to you, will you let me put my hand on you, my right hand on you, and bless you, and heal you, and restore you? Don't be afraid. You know, the truth is, the only one we should fear is Jesus. He's the only one we should be afraid of, and he's the one who says, fear not. So what is there to fear? Whom shall we be afraid, the Apostle Paul says. Who shall separate us from the love of God? Nothing, in Romans 8, he says can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. So friends, despite all appearances, despite your own isolation, your despair, your fear, your shame, your guilt, your uncertainty, your anxiety, the king of the universe is with you, longs for you to hear him say, fear not, longs for you to know his touch, to bless you and restore you. And this is why there's not a better way for us to end our time together than by coming to the table of the Lord and celebrating communion. Perhaps you've got those elements ready. I'm gonna encourage you to get them uh, right now. If, uh, take a moment, go get them if you don't have them, but prepare bread and cup. I'll grab mine here. Because in these simple elements of bread and cup, we remember what Jesus says to John in, that, in, in verse eight, 18. I was dead and I am alive forevermore. I died, and I have risen, and I am reigning. It's the bread his body and the cup his blood that symbolize this central truth. He alone holds the keys to our forgiveness, to our freedom, to our salvation, and to eternity. And it's in coming to him that we receive all that we need. So it doesn't matter today whether you're part of our church family or you're brand new to this, if you know Jesus, if you've trusted in him for forgiveness, then you're welcome at his table. I'm going to pray and then lead us to the elements together. 
Lord Jesus, we pause to acknowledge that you are the king of the universe and we have such a small vision of who you are. We desperately need to see you in all your glory, like John. And when we do get even just the smallest glimpse, Lord, we're tempted to fall down as though we're dead because we recognize our own sin. And in this moment, God, we, we need to hear you say to us, place your hand on us by your spirit and say to us, fear not. Because in you, Jesus, we're forgiven and we're free. So help us to prepare now to come to your table through bread and cup and remember who you are and what you have done. Amen. The Bible tells us that Jesus took bread and broke it and passed it to his disciples. And he said, this is my body and it's given for you. Eat this and remember him. The scripture says that after they had eaten together, Jesus poured out a cup saying, this is the new covenant in my blood shed for the forgiveness of your sins. And that every time we, his followers, throughout the world in history, eat the bread and drink the cup, we proclaim his death and resurrection until he returns. Let's do that together. Amen. Friends, thanks for joining us and tuning in to worship together and to celebrate communion and to praise the name of our God. I want to leave you with the words from an old hymn that might be familiar to some of you. Maybe not, but I love them and I hope they bless you. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face and the things of this earth will go strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Amen, and go in peace. <laughs>